Listen. Perhaps you catch a hint of an ancient state not quite forgotten. Dim, perhaps, and yet not altogether unfamiliar. Like a song whose name is long forgotten and the circumstances in which you heard completely unremembered. Listen. Not the whole song has stayed with you, but just a little wisp of melody attached not to a person or a place or anything particular. But you remember from just this little part how lovely was the song. How wonderful the setting where you heard it. And how you loved those who were there and listened with you. Listen. These are not ordinary books. They were dictated, not written. They are about love, about forgiveness, and about inner peace. They contain a whole philosophy for living in our times. And this is the story of how they came into being. In 1958, I accepted an appointment as professor of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Shortly after I arrived at Columbia, one of my first duties was to hire a research psychologist for a special collaborative study program. In the course of looking for the right person, I found Dr. Helen Shuckman. Helen and I worked together very closely for the next seven years on a wide variety of academic, professional, clinical, and administrative issues. For the most part, I think we worked quite effectively. But there was also a great deal of conflict and stress in our personal and professional relationships. In her unpublished autobiography, Helen, who died on February 9th, 1981, described her reactions to her job and the highly stressful situations that existed there. I was a psychologist, educator, conservative in theory and atheistic in belief. I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting, and the job was ghastly at first. The hospital didn't provide space for our projects, and when we were finally housed in the new research building, it was the most difficult situation of my professional life. The work was oppressive and carried out in an atmosphere of suspicion and competitiveness, and interpersonal harmony was depressingly lacking. Then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could never have predicted. My first impressions of Helen were a little difficult to define. She seemed to me to be a very complex person. On the one hand, she was obviously brilliant. She certainly had a very dedicated research orientation. On the other hand, there was a kind of peripheral feeling of orbiting, and I'm not quite sure how to define that, but a feeling that she was going in circles somehow. And it took me a while to realize that that was a very superficial impression, and that any question I asked her uh, evoked a very uh, solid answer. Often, Helen and I would leave our offices in the late afternoon while we were working on a project or a paper and spend some time near my apartment in Central Park. I felt extremely close to Helen. I felt she was the one person who cared about what happened in my professional life. But I also think she felt a much closer personal relationship with me than I felt I could reciprocate. Bill is some 14 years younger than I and over a foot taller. He rarely attacked openly when he was angry or irritated, but was much more likely to become increasingly aloof and unresponsive. 
I, on the other hand, tended to become over-involved and then feel hopelessly trapped and resentful. Helen related in a very professional way with patients that with some people she tuned in immediately and had a great sense of rapport. She understood what they were like. She was able to perhaps see through their defenses and uh, was extremely practical. I was having some emotional difficulties, uh, largely with family matters. And uh, so Helen kindly counseled me. And in the course of this dialogue, a very kind exchange, uh, she discovered that uh, I'd been separated from my mother for some 14 years. And I really wasn't quite sure where she was. It turned out that she was institutionalized. And within half an hour the next day, Helen located through some contacts in the State Department of Mental Health in New York State, uh, found where my mother was lodged, and had caught, spoken to the physician in charge of my mother, and the following Sunday arranged for me to visit. And with Helen's support and help, I was uh, able to reestablish a, a very loving relationship uh, with my mother, uh, first as a friend and then as a loving son. And it was so typical of, of Helen's concern. We had worked together for a number of years, actually from 1958 until the summer of 1965, with a good deal of improvement in terms of the organization of the psychology department at the hospital. But we weren't really at peace. And one day I gave Helen a little speech this was in June of 1965, before we were going to a meeting. Essentially what I said is, there must be a better way of living and working in the world, of handling our personal and professional relationships and problems, and I'm determined to find it. Uh, this was kind of a long speech for me, and I remember feeling at the end of this that Helen probably was going to laugh, but to my amazement, quite the contrary. She said, you're absolutely right, Bill. We'll find this other way together. And that was the beginning of a joint commitment which the two of us made. Helen was always very much involved in her work with mentally retarded children. She found particular gratification in working with children who had these handicaps and found them especially responsive and highly lovable. On the other hand, Helen would have been the first to assure any of us that she would not have made a good mother herself and had no wish to assume that role. When we walked in Central Park, as we often did, we would visit Lewis Carroll's Ellis in Wonderland near the boating pond, and that was one of Helen's favorite spots. On one of these occasions, Helen told me about a recurring childhood dream from which she never quite recovered. It centered on a red and yellow rubber ball, which showed up in many dreams over the years, and which she equated with unhappy aspects of her childhood. The ball was in the crib at the foot. And my father came into the doorway and I was lying there very happily thinking how pretty I was and how warm. He just stayed there and looked and didn't come in. And I was very little so I couldn't get up myself and go over. In the dream, I saw myself turn from a very pretty little girl into a very ugly one. And he just looked and then went away. So I did turn into a very ugly girl. I was fat and horrible and all the boys turned me down. My mother said I looked like an elephant and she couldn't stand it. Helen had a very lonely childhood. Her mother and father had lives of their own, and she had nothing in common with her brother, who was 14 years older. 
she spent most of her time with a Catholic governess and a Baptist cook. Helen's parents were non-observant Jews, and there was no discouragement or interest when Helen started to experiment with being, at different times, Catholic and Baptist. After a long series of disappointments, Helen gave up her search for God, and when she became a graduate student in psychology, her beliefs shifted from agnosticism to angry atheism. But that, as it turned out, was not the real end of the story. Ever since I was a child, I would often see very clear pictures when I closed my eyes. The pictures could be of anything. A birthday cake with lighted candles, a woman with a dog, trees in the woods, a store window filled with shoes. For years, my mental pictures had usually been motionless and in black and white. I could become aware of them at any time, even with my eyes open. But suddenly they began to appear in color and in motion. And so did my dreams. The summer of 1965 was a, uh, an extraordinary summer for both Helen and me in a number of ways. Helen began to have a great deal of what you might call heightened visual imagery or dream sequences. Uh, she began to experience this with considerable clarity, and I suggested that she write down these experiences as they occurred, because they seemed to have something, very, they were saying something very important, even though we didn't know exactly what that was. One of those sequences uh, involved being in a boat. The boat was moving slowly but easily along a very straight little canal. was just enough breeze to help the boat along. The sides of the canal were lined with lovely old trees and edged with banks of flowers. I wonder if there is buried treasure here, I thought to myself dreamily. I shouldn't be surprised if there were. Then I noticed a long pole with a large hook on the end lying on the bottom of the boat. Just the thing, I thought, dropping the hook into the water and reaching the pole down as far as I could. The hook caught something heavy, and I raised it with difficulty. It was an ancient treasure chest, the wood worn from the water and the bottom covered with seaweed. There was nothing in the chest but a large black book like the spring binders used for holding manuscripts or papers together. On the spine, one word was written in gold. The word was Esculapius. The word was familiar, but I could not remember what it meant. When I looked it up, I found that it was the name of the Greek god of healing. I saw the same book once more a few nights later. This time, there was a string of pearls around it. In addition to her extraordinary dreams, Helen astonished me with detailed descriptions of places where I was staying on vacation, 
although she had never even seen them. She insisted one day that a friend of mine was trying to commit suicide. We telephoned him, and she was right. Thankfully, we were able to talk him out of it. As a research psychologist, Helen couldn't understand this flood of mental imagery, these uh, uh, various psychic experiences that she kept having, and it had a cumulative impact on her during the summer of 65. She kept wondering, am I losing my mind? Am I going crazy? How do I reconcile this with my role as a scientist? So her conflict certainly increased enormously during that period. This psychic phase ended abruptly with a particularly clear picture episode in which I knew I had made an irrevocable choice. I saw myself entering a cave cut into a rock formation on a bleak, windswept sea coast. What I found in the cave was a large and very old parchment scroll. Its ends were attached to heavy gold-tipped poles, and the scroll was wrapped around them so that they met in the middle of the scroll and were tied tightly together. I managed to untie the ends and open the scroll just enough to reveal the center panel, on which two words were written, God is. Then I unrolled the scroll all the way, and as I did so, tiny letters began to appear on both sides of the panel. The silent voice, which I had heard before, explained the situation mentally to me. If you look at the left side, you will be able to read the past, said the voice. If you look at the right side, you will be able to read the future. But I hesitated only a moment before rolling up the scroll sufficiently to conceal everything except the center panel. I am not interested in reading the past or the future, I said with finality. I will just stop with this. The voice sounded both reassured and reassuring. You made it that time, it said. Thank you. And that, it seemed, was that. During part of that summer, we were both traveling, and perhaps as a means of clarifying her thoughts on emerging spiritual themes, Helen began writing a series of letters to me. Saturday. Dear Bill, I hope you will bear with this because it may be important for both of us. This morning I kept saying, sort of without intention, I am a channel. Which seemed to mean something at the time. but the channel got clogged up. It's not open yet. Monday. Dear Bill, one evening we were walking and my husband Louis pointed out a brain-injured boy, about 12 or so, who was being pushed by his parents in a carriage. There were other disabled children there too. As we walked, I suddenly and briefly got a sense of everyone walking happily and very much together on the same path, like on a ladder. We're not all on the same path yet, but we will all make it home eventually. Tuesday, dear Bill. I'm not sure I want to write this, 
but I have an idea I'm obeying an order. These orders are rather stern, and the main feeling I get is that I wouldn't dare to disobey them. This is the second one. Helen prided herself as a research psychologist, not as someone who heard voices, who had heightened visual imagery, who experienced all of these psychic events that occurred throughout the summer of 65. It was extremely distressing to her. She kept feeling that maybe she was losing her mind. Certainly, she couldn't reconcile all of this activity with her scientific predilections. And this became a particularly acute problem for her as the summer and early fall began. One night she called me, and uh, this was in October, and said, you know, that inner voice refuses to go away. It keeps saying, this is a course in miracles. Please take notes. What shall I do? Suppose it's crazy. Suppose it doesn't make any sense, you know. Suppose it's flipped. And uh, she was obviously going through a great deal of anguish and agony at that point. Well, I said the only obvious thing, why don't you take down whatever it is, you can read it to me tomorrow morning in the office, and if it doesn't make any sense, no one else ever has to know about it. But at least we'll know what it is. So that's what we did. The next morning, Helen came in, and as she read that beautiful introduction to the text, which says, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. It was obvious that we were tuning in to something that could hardly be regarded as crazy, no matter how unexpected it was. This is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Only the time that you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear. But what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. On that first morning when Helen came up, she was in quite a state. She could hardly talk. Her voice was almost inaudible. And I kept saying to Helen, don't worry about what it says. Just read it to me, then we can look at it later. It doesn't matter. Uh, no one will have to know. We'll tear it up. We'll do whatever is necessary. But just read it to me. And it was very difficult for her to even do that. She would cough and sputter and almost have a seizure rather than being able to simply read the words calmly. Sometimes I would use one hand holding on to her <laughs> while I was trying to type with the other hand. And that extreme anxiety continued for a while, certainly during the early phases of the text when we encountered something like the first 50 principles on miracles. Miracles as such do not matter. The only thing that matters is their source, which is far beyond evaluation. Miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. 
The real miracle is the love that inspires them. In this sense, everything that comes from love is a miracle. The term miracle was one that, that bothered me at first. I think it bothered Helen too. The idea of a course in miracles seemed rather absurd. Yet, when it defined a miracle as removing the barriers to our awareness of love's presence, it then began to make sense. Miracles reawaken the awareness that the spirit, not the body, is the altar of truth. This is the recognition that leads to the healing power of the miracle. Miracles are natural signs of forgiveness. Through miracles, you accept God's forgiveness by extending it to others. I realized as we continued typing up these first 50 principles with all the difficulties of getting it down and all the anxiety and so forth, that I would have to really change my mind about absolutely everything if this were true. And that seemed like a very big job. I wasn't sure I was up to it. And later I realized it's only a little willingness that is necessary. Uh, readiness does not imply mastery, simply some willingness for change. So I recognized I had some willingness to do that. Helen was fearful, I think, of making any kind of very specific commitment about this. As a matter of fact, she said, uh, you, you're responsible for what it says. I don't want to know exactly what it says, but if it makes any grammatical errors, if it goofs in any way, then it's had it, and I will refuse to continue. A major contribution of miracles is their strength in releasing you from your false sense of isolation, deprivation, and lack. A miracle is never lost. It may touch many people you have not even met and produce undreamed of changes in situations of which you are not even aware. After I typed up whatever Helen might have dictated during a, a particular day, we would go back over the copy, checking carefully to be sure that we had all of the words exactly the way they were supposed to be. Helen at times was tempted to change a word, and then she would recognize that if she did that, it would not make sense later. So that her integrity in recording this material precisely as it came was extraordinary. She simply chose not to associate herself with it because of its high threat value at that time. She certainly did know what the material said, and she did understand it. I would feel the writing coming on almost daily, and sometimes several times a day. Evenings turned out to be a favorite time for dictation. I objected bitterly to this and often went to bed defiantly without writing anything. But I could not sleep. Eventually, I got up in some disgust and wrote as directed. I never knew when I started a sentence how it would end, and the ideas came so quickly that I had trouble keeping up with them. Helen could turn it on or off at any time. She could stop in the middle of a sentence without even going back to reread what she had written and continue when she had a moment. She could uh, have a research conference uh, in mid-sentence. It made no difference at all. The flow of the material continued without any altered state. Helen at no time was in a trance or anything remotely resembling a trance. You may believe that you are responsible for what you do, but not for what you think. The truth is that you are responsible for what you think because it is only at this level that you can exercise choice. 
What you do comes from what you think. Do not try to look beyond yourself for truth. For truth can only be within you. At the time the course began, I would have termed myself an agnostic. I really had no interest in formal religion, but I was also aware of the deficiencies in the psychological systems of thought with which I was familiar. And I recognized that somehow the emperor had no clothes, that there were so many of us going around expounding our various theoretical points of view, but there was no one who really knew how to put this together in a meaningful way to change the nature of our lives. You have but two emotions, love and fear. One you made and one was given you. Each is a way of seeing and different worlds arise from their different sights. See the love of God in you, and you will see it everywhere. Because it is everywhere. With love in you, you have no need except to extend it. When the course began, I began to recognize that uh, the two emotions, fear and love, which it talks about, were really the only two emotions that mattered. And that if I could learn to let go of fear, I would automatically experience love, because that is our natural reality. As I continue to practice letting go of my own defensiveness, I became aware that the Course is really about undoing. It's about forgiveness, about forgiving ourselves and others for the mistakes that we have made and not holding on to these in a way that increases our sense of guilt and unworthiness. What could you want forgiveness cannot give? Do you want peace? Forgiveness offers it. Do you want happiness? A quiet mind? A certainty of purpose? And a sense of worth and beauty that transcends the world? Do you want care and safety and the warmth of sure protection always? All of this forgiveness offers you. Forgive the world, and you will understand that everything that God created cannot have an end. And nothing he did not create is real. In this one sentence is our course explained. While the course came in a form which I had never anticipated, I did regard this as the answer to my question, there must be another way, and I'm determined to find it. And it seemed to me that to the extent I valued being a scientist, I should look at all the evidence before dismissing it. There was an initial reaction, can this be it? You know, is this something totally preposterous? But as I read the material, I recognized that Helen in no way could have written this material. It was totally alien to her background, to her interests, and her mode of conceptualizing abstract ideas, that uh, there's no way she could have done this. Where did the writing come from? I did not understand the calm but impressive authority with which the voice dictated. It is largely because of the strangely compelling nature of this authority that I have referred to the voice with a capital V. At several points in the writing, the voice itself speaks in no uncertain terms about the author, Jesus. My own reactions to these references, which literally stunned me at the time, have decreased in intensity and are now at a level of wonder and acceptance. I do re remember one occasion very keenly 
when Helen came in one day and she was really distraught. She was perhaps more distraught than I'd seen her in some time. And this was while we were perhaps uh, somewhere in the middle of the text. And she said, this time it's really gone off the deep end. It's gibberish. It makes absolutely no sense, no meaning, nothing to it. It's absolutely impossible. I refuse to read it to you and so forth. After I had calmed her down, why she did agree to read the material to me. And I might quote the very end of that section. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only our unwillingness to accept your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. At that point, Helen burst into tears. The beauty of the language, the profundity of the thought, and the, in a sense, the equivalence of the Lord's Prayer for the Course seemed to be so clear that this was a statement in the Course very similar to the Lord's Prayer in many of its dimensions. And it made a very profound impact on Helen, as well as, of course, on me. Every once in a while, I mean, the frustration would reach the point that one or both would say in unison, why me or why us? I mean, uh, what did we do to deserve this? <laughs> and, uh, but that passed, that passed. Uh, the, the import and the content of the Course was, was making a great impression upon, it, uh, upon them. Um, and uh, the responsibility of the task was very important. And uh, if anything, I think it increased over, over the years. I think they reached a point of, of at least some accommodation to it and some sense of, of comfort simply out of the organization that they developed in handling the task of transcription in an orderly way. I attribute this largely to, to Bill. And it was necessary to sustain Helen with this framework, the discipline of this framework. As the material developed, of course, a great deal of it became increasingly beautiful Hundreds of pages are in iambic pentameter, Shakespearean blank verse. And uh, when we discovered that, it was almost as if we were being given words and music at the same time. Let us be still an instant and forget all things we ever learned, all thoughts we had and every preconception that we hold of what things mean and what their purpose is. Let us remember not our own ideas of what the world is for. We do not know. Let every image held by everyone be loosened from our minds and swept away. Be innocent of judgment, unaware of any thoughts of evil or of good, that ever crossed your mind of anyone. Now do you know him not, but you are free to learn of him and learn of him anew. Now is he born again to you, and you are born again to him, without the past that sentenced him to die, and you with him. Now is he free to live as you are free because an ancient learning passed away and left a place for truth to be reborn. The first part of the material that we worked on lasted for almost three years and uh, ended up as a 622-page volume. 
We didn't know when we started what A Course in Miracles was going to be. We didn't know whether it might be a few pages, you know, what, whatever it was, we had no idea. But Helen did ask at one point, how will I know when this is over? And she was told, you will hear the word Amen. And that occurs at the very end of the text where it says, and now we say Amen. There are times when they both felt uh, pressured, tired, exhausted, uh, or Helen was ill with the cold or a sinus infection. And nonetheless, that didn't make any difference as far as the course was concerned. The mater material still came through. When the text was finished, Helen felt, as I did, that that was the completion of our assignment and that we had plenty to do to simply try to learn those concepts and apply them in our lives. However, after a period of perhaps nine months, Helen got increasingly restless. Then one day, she began to take down the workbook for students, which consists of 365 lessons, one for each day of the year. And that was the beginning of the second part of the course. That took approximately two and a half years and at the end of that we again thought that we were finished and after a number of months again of not being quite sure what would happen next the third and final volume was announced as the manual for teachers. So the total period of time was approximately seven years from the time we began with the text, including the workbook, and finally, the manual for teachers. The journey to God is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always and what you are forever. It is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. You dwell not here, but in eternity. You travel but in dreams, while safe at home. By the fall of 1972, Helen and I had completed the Course in Miracles, with the exception of a clarification of terms section, which we added later. At that time, I decided to make about 12 Xerox copies of the Course, keeping them, of course, hidden and secret, and available for those few people who might wander into our lives and really be interested and prepared for this material. I had no idea who they might be, and I certainly suspected that the number would be very small. Anyway, I had shared this with one of my graduate students, a Father Michael, and uh, in the course of talking with him about his interests in spirituality and mysticism and so forth, we discover that there was a psychologist named Kenneth Wapnick who was working in one of the New York State hospitals. And Ken Wapnick had done a doctoral dissertation on St. Teresa and schizophrenia. Now this seemed like a very strange topic for anyone in psychology to be working on, so I was quite intrigued. And Helen and I actually met Ken in November of 1972, just before he was scheduled to make a trip to Israel. And when I did return to the States in the May of 1973, I made a beeline for Helen and Bill's office at Columbia Presbyterian. And that was when I saw The Course in Miracles for the first time. And what they did is that Bill sat me in his office. He went into Helen's office, which was immediately adjacent to it. And Helen gave me her two most favorite sections of the text, are the section for they have come in chapter 26, which I think is one of the most beautiful uh, parts of the whole course, and then the final section of the text, Choose Once Again. And both of those, those sections almost literally knocked me off my feet. It was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever read uh, that in addition said something. Trials are but lessons that you failed to learn, presented once again. So where you made a faulty choice before, you now can make a better one and thus escape all pain that what you chose before has brought to you.
In every difficulty, all distress and each perplexity, Christ calls to you and gently says, My brother, choose again. Shortly after that, when I began reading the Course from cover to cover, it became clear to me that my, that my destiny was not to return to Israel and live in the monastery, which is what I thought at that point, but that I should spend the rest of my time with Helen and Bill in New York City, and that, that indeed is what we did. What was remarkable was that there were virtually no changes in the, in the, the actual text of all the Course. Um, the, the, the major editing was involved only in chapter designation and the physical organization of the printed work. But the manuscripts were remarkable in their order and clarity, directly, uh, just as Helen translated it from her shorthand notes. This was the manuscript that I had seen. Some of the titles I felt were not really appropriate to the, the section. The capitalization was inconsistent, the paragraphing was inconsistent, the punctuation was inconsistent, etc. So I discussed this with Helen and Bill, and saying that I really felt it should be gone through one more time just to be sure that it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. So Helen and I began this somewhere in the late fall of 1973, going through the, the entire manuscript line by line, word by word. Uh, this took about a year. At that point, I think that the manuscript was basically uh, some 1,500 pages. This was a huge job, as you can imagine. I it made Helen very, very anxious to have to go back over all this material so that a lot of time had to be spent in coaxing her to do this, but she did recognize that this was a very, very important project. Uh, we discussed with Bill anything that we did in terms of any changes that we might have made, and we always felt that, that Jesus was really helping us do this, uh, that, that anything that we were doing was really done with his guidance and his blessing. The name of Jesus Christ as such is but a symbol but it stands for love that is not of this world. This course comes from him because his words have reached you in a language you can love and understand. The name of Jesus is the name of one who was a man but saw the face of Christ in all his brothers and remembered God. Is he the Christ? Oh yes, along with you. One of the things that I was most impressed with about the Course was the fact that Jesus was the author of it. I just could not believe that anybody else could have written it. It was very clear to me that Helen couldn't have written it, and I couldn't imagine it having any other source but Jesus himself. When the Course started coming through Helen, she felt extremely uncomfortable in sharing this with her husband, Louis. This was mainly because the Course was so Christian in its statement and because Louis was such an identified Jew. It was clear that he would find the content of the Course very difficult, not to mention the process of the writing itself. So Helen did explain to him what was happening, but omitting the fact that Jesus was the voice that she was hearing. Helen also shared some of the material with him, but carefully choosing those parts of the Course that did not contain specific Christian language. Louis' response was that he was interested, that he was fascinated by what his wife was doing, and his own way was encouraging in terms of her completing this task. It was also clear to us that this Course was not just given to Helen and Bill, uh, or to me or a few other people, but was really meant for the world. But this wasn't something we felt was our, our job as such. So that we did feel some kind of pressure to get the manuscript finished, retyped, and then we would just wait. Helen was not comfortable with the problems of, of what to do with the material, how to get it published, how to uh, disseminate it. And also she was extremely concerned, uh, as was Bill, with what effect the knowledge of this course and its, and its dissemination would have upon their professional lives because um, they were eminent um, people professionally and uh, one professionally, one in their field did not involve, get, become involved in metaphysical works of this type. It was really too uh, radical. Helen was due for retirement from the medical center the end of June in 1975. 
I had already been able to, to extend her tenure for almost a year, but at this point she would have to resign her professorship because of age. I had been quite concerned during this period that somehow the course be in other hands than ours. It seemed to me that the course was waiting for a home and I wasn't quite sure where that home was going to be or how we would find it. I was teaching at New York University in 1975 and feeling full up with an exciting career in what we then called experimental parapsychology or consciousness research, meeting very interesting people, traveling, speaking, and I was feeling a sort of emptiness. I didn't know why. Being full up, one should think that one would really be happy. I found myself quickly sinking into a sense of self-loathing and also a quandary of desperation. I didn't know where to turn. I felt bereft. One night, I locked myself in the bathroom in my home, and I went to pieces. I could say it was a form of surrender. I called out from the bottom of my heart, won't someone up there please help me? And I meant it. Within a very short time, I received the help I sought, but not in the form I anticipated. A few days after, I was asked by a good friend to accompany him to meet two professors of medical psychology at Columbia University School of Physicians and Surgeons. I went with him, not knowing what to expect or why the meeting, but it seemed as if I was supposed to go. And that kind of mood continued as Bill took us inside the university where we had lunch with Bill and his associate, Helen Shuckman. I found her to be a very clever woman, very intellectual and well-spoken, quite articulate and a bit sharp, and I was intimidated. And the conversation was going in all different directions and a little bit bemused I found myself turning to Helen and saying to her, you're hearing an inner voice, aren't you? And I didn't really know what I meant. But she seemed quite startled, and she said, I beg your pardon. And Bill tried to soothe the situation. He said, oh, well, Helen, let's go back to our office and let's talk about this in private. And the two of them took me back to their office and closed the door, and there we met for the first time Kenneth Wapnick. We all sat together as Helen and Bill told us the story of their last 10 years and the scribing of A Course in Miracles. I listened to the story intently, and I was there a few hours, and they had lots to tell me, and I had questions. And finally, I was anxious to see this document called A Course in Miracles in its black binder that Helen had predicted in a vision. And Helen seemed a little bit startled at that point. It was one thing telling me the story. It was something else showing it to me. But Bill opened the filing cabinet, and he told Helen that she's going to see it sooner or later. It might as well be now. And he handed her the book. And there were actually seven volumes, but I could only see one at a time. So she handed me the text with its introduction. And I took it from her, and I put it on my lap, as the others were talking among themselves. And I looked down at it. I opened up the black binder, and I turned to the introduction. And I read, this is a course in miracles. It's a required course. And there was no question in my mind that I was being given a miracle and that I had asked for it. Tolerance for pain may be high, but it is not without limit. Eventually, everyone begins to recognize, however dimly, that there must be a better way. As this recognition becomes more firmly established, it becomes a turning point. This ultimately reawakens spiritual vision. Helen and Ken and I frequently met at Judy's apartment at the Beresford on Central Park West. This was an opportunity for us to gather together, meet people who are interested in metaphysical ideas, uh, particularly people who are interested in the course, since Judy had managed to disseminate the course in Xerox form very quickly to a large number of her friends. And I had this tremendous sense of relief 
that I could release those 12 copies that I'd been hiding in the closet and that Judy had taken the ball and was running with it, that she was doing the things that were needed at that point to disseminate the material, to begin to get critical reactions from people, and in a sense to socialize us to what was going on in the larger world outside of academia, where we have been confined for so many years. We met a large number of very eminent people in California, as well as in New York, who were serious students of the course. All of them wanted additional copies. Everyone was dissatisfied with the fact that this was available only by rapidly Xeroxing hundreds and hundreds of pages of material. So it became apparent in the course of this that we were going to have to entertain the idea of publication. At that point, several people did come up, made offers uh, to publish the, the course in its entirety, but none of this seemed exactly right. One wanted to shorten it. Another one wanted to edit it severely. Another one wanted to remove the Christian terminology. Distortions here, distortions there, and it didn't feel right. We really had a sense that this document was to stay intact as Helen took it down with no changes. There didn't seem to be anyone at all who wanted to do it just that way. And we resorted to a technique that we still use very actively in our lives of asking together when we had a problem mutually that we wanted to solve. We would sit around, discuss the problem, and then close our eyes and phrase a question internally and wait for a feeling, a phrase, an answer in some form that we felt was accurate. We implored the Holy Spirit within to give us guidance. The guidance we got was that the material was supposed to be published and soon, and that indeed it was to be disseminated, and also that it was to be kept intact. We were told through asking through our inner selves that only those who were to do this and only this the rest of their lives should be involved and that they would be caretakers of the information. We wondered who that possibly could be, and we looked around the room and realized <laughs> there we were. But where was the money to come from? And that was the question. That was one thing we didn't have. <laughs> we sat in quiet, and I remember even the date that that happened. It was Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1976, because as we sat quietly, internalizing, asking the Holy Spirit, the voice for God, to direct us and to tell us the answer to that question, I heard something so clearly that I couldn't deny it. And the answer was, make the commitment first. I knew it had to be true. So we did. We said, we will. We went to sleep that night. I woke up in the morning thinking I was a bit daft. The telephone rang. And there at the other end of the line, calling me from Mazatlan, Mexico, was a man I'd only met once. His name was Reed Erickson. He said to me, I'm studying the manuscript called A Course in Miracles, given to me by your friend, Zelda Suplee. And I am so delighted with a thought system that I can truly follow, that I have been working with a group here in Mexico, studying it. And I told him I was very glad to hear that, and we chatted a bit. And he said, but you know, the form in which it is now is very unwieldy. You have to have it published in hard-covered books. And I told him, well, that is very synchronistic. That's exactly what we were speaking of. And I, I related to him how we had been sitting and asking for guidance on this. So I said, we're ready to go, but really, Eric, I have no idea where the funds are to come from. He said, well, that's the reason I'm calling you. I was interdirected to sell a piece of land only last week. And your foundation has all the money it needs to publish 5,000 hard-covered copies of A Course in Miracles. Do it immediately. Beyond the body, beyond the sun and stars, past everything you see and yet somehow familiar, is an arc of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The edges of the circle disappear, and what is in it 
is no longer contained at all. The light expands and covers everything, extending to infinity, forever shining and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity. Nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside. For there is nowhere that this light is not. What is a miracle but this remembering? And who is there in whom this memory lies not? The light in one awakens it in all. And when you see it in your brother, you are remembering for everyone.